So what we talked about yesterday was we started talking about uh, personality. Uh, and you will see in that lecture uh, where I give a definition of personality. Uh, basically, this is just our recognizable uh, behaviors, thought patterns, emotional patterns, right? It's kind of how we distinguish one from another. It's how, uh, in some ways, we distinguish ourselves from other people. When you're thinking about personality from the inside out, it's, it's a little bit different, but that still works. You can still think about uh, what types of behaviors you have, what types of emotions you have, etc. <clears throat> so we started looking at this idea of personality, and we also talked about Sigmund Freud, Um, uh, and we just noted sort of who he was and primarily thinking about uh, this idea of him being really responsible both for the idea of talk therapy or at least um, kind of making that famous and useful, right? Before Sigmund Freud, we really <clears throat> would just think about psychology in terms of this kind of very physical way of being. So if you showed up into an office and you said, hey, I'm really sad, and I did a brain scan on you, I'm um, sort of thinking about this in modern times, but if I did this uh, brain scan on you and I said, listen, there's nothing wrong with your brain, uh, if you're being sad, you're just lying to me. You're just making this up. So go home, I don't have time for that. So we didn't have this real concept of psychology, right? That something could be wrong with you that's separate than your physicality, right? That you could have some emotional piece, that you could have some cognitive piece, uh, or even behavioral piece. <clears throat> that was affecting you in these ways. And so Freud was one of the first people to, to sort of move psychiatry or move psychology outside of psychiatry to say, let's try some of these other things like talk therapy. And one of the ways that he understood that folks might have stuff that's going on for them that wasn't exactly medical was that he had this concept uh, of the unconscious. <clears throat> Uh, who can tell me what they think the unconscious is? What is that? Yes, sir. You, like, your mind that you don't actively think about, but in your, like, you don't think about it, it's just there in your mind. So you're saying your mind that you don't actively think about? Yeah. It's just in your mind? Good. Okay. What else? I like that. Unconscious. Yes, sir. When you're asleep, your brain doesn't just stop thinking or things like that. I mean, you have dreams and things like that. Okay, so dreams might be a part of that being asleep. Mm -hmm. Might be a part of that. Good. Yep. Your more like natural instincts. Like instead of having to rely on thought or anything like that, you just instinct like kind of like instinctively do it based on. I don't know. So you're saying instincts might be a part of that unconscious piece. I would. Um, Yes, that's a, that's a great thought. Uh, I want you to hold on to that. Well, maybe you won't be in here that day. This is so weird. But I want you to hold on to that thought at least when we start talking about uh, Carl Jung and his thoughts about personality and his thoughts about the unconscious, that idea of instincts. But yes, I do think we can think about instincts being inside of that, uh, that part of the, the mind, the unconscious. So just literally, right, what this word means is unaware. Conscious just means aware, an awareness. And so here when we say unconsciousness, we really mean an unawareness. Now, sometimes you'll hear this, especially in popular media, referred to as the subconscious. There is something in the mind called the subconscious. It actually fits between consciousness and unconsciousness. I'll, I'll show you that here in a second. But uh, just this idea of unconsciousness, again, was Freud's. And he had this sense that our mind was this sort of vast, dark place. If you uh, watch the video from yesterday, you'll see me uh, give this uh, reading of a quote. I don't know if I did too well, but uh, I give a reading of a quote where Freud is referring to the mind as this really dark place. And that our consciousness is like a candle uh, in, in an otherwise dark house. That is to say, you can only see what the candle can illuminate. 
you can't see the whole house. It's not like all the lights are on in the house. You can only sort of see a little bit at, the, at a time. You may not know where some of the rooms are. You may not know that, some, that there are some rooms in the house, right? That we don't really have a fully revealed sense of our psyche, a fully revealed uh, sense of our mind. We really can only tap into a little piece at a time. <clears throat> and Freud said that everything that's left out of that spotlight, everything that's left out of that candlelight even, is in the unconscious. Any questions about that? So far? So how does unconscious refer to like a person? Like what so what kind of actions would be referred to as unconscious? What type you ask me what type of actions yeah. would be considered an unconscious, an unconscious action. Um, sure. uh, why are your legs crossed? You did that, so yeah. comfort. You have some comfort. What makes that more comfortable than if you flip them over? My chin's on one. The other way. Did you think of all that? Like, did you have this thought process when you decided to cross your legs here? Or did you just end up this way? And it happens to be comfortable. Well, that's an unconscious behavior, right? You get the point. This, this idea that we're gonna be doing things all the time, right? If you just check your posture, or you maybe check what you're wearing, or you sort of tap in really quickly to where your mind went when I said that one word, right? That we do things all the time that, I don't know, Type of people do you date? You know, why do you like them to look like that? Why do you like them to have that particular style or behavior? Right? Probably something to do with your mom, but we'll get into that in a couple more classes. But right, that that's unconscious too. I don't know where that comes from. Attraction, right? Eye of the beholder. All of those things are are unconscious. <clears throat> One of the tasks I gave. Uh, to my other class, to the class yesterday, was to really try to think about some of the things that maybe you do that end up being unconscious, right? Things, feelings that you have that you don't know where they come from, or small behaviors, things that you wear, right? Little things like that that you might say, I, I never really put any thought to it, I kind of just do it. And if you dig in, maybe you'll find some. Be careful. All right, so anybody seen this? Any other questions? Good question. Anybody seen this before? What's what's gonna go on here? Yes, ma'am. Um, doesn't it have something to do with like ego, super ego, ego, like oh. states of consciousness? Very good. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we'll get into that. Very basically, right? I've sort of drawn a little iceberg here. And so one of the ways that Freud thought about consciousness was this idea that everything above the water in this illustration is representative of consciousness and everything below the water is representative of unconsciousness. Now, what are some basic observations that you can make just from this diet? Yeah? Uh, the amount that we are unconsciousness comes to the amount that we are conscious. Very good. So the amount of space at least devoted to unconsciousness is larger than the space devoted to consciousness. And this again is reflective of how Freud saw our consciousness with respect to unconsciousness, that it really was a smaller aspect. Now, I think Freud would take issue with my drawing and probably prefer I put it up here somewhere, All right? Again, the spotlight in a house, or excuse me, a candlelight in a house. That's almost a quarter of the house. I don't know any candles that are right. So 
right? It really should be a very small amount according to Freud, but we can argue about that. Anything else? So there is this idea, um, and I don't usually mention it, but I had a student ask me about it after class yesterday. There is this idea of a subconscious. And the subconscious are things that are accessible to our conscious mind. Things that we can get to. Things that we can think of. But that just aren't presently minded to us. Right? When's your mom's birthday? Uh, August 14th, 1981. Right, so you had this moment of having to dig into your head to, to retrieve that information, right? It wasn't on the top of your mind, right? It wasn't immediately conscious, but it, it was available to you. Right? It wasn't in your head immediately, but it was available to you. So the subconscious is sort of <clears throat> this part of the mind that we can access, but just isn't available to us at any given moment. And then the unconscious, again, is supposed to be the part of this mind that we really don't have easy, if any, access to. Right? Freud would say that you need therapy to get down here, or intense meditation, or a profound religious experience. That this stuff doesn't just show up because we think about it. Uh, that really something deep has to happen. It's probably where we get the idea of deep. That something deep has to happen in order for us to be able to tap into that. Yeah? Is it possible for consciousness to become unconscious and vice versa? Or is it like as soon as you uncover something unconscious, the lowest it goes into subconscious? Do you have an example you're thinking of? Well, I'm like, you know, like you said, if we viewed like some of the habits that we do unconsciously, we, you know, we become aware of them and then we think about them. But like, if you're conscious of it, can you ever like just kind of, I guess, forget it almost to the point that you don't know it's there anymore? Or is it just kind of like become a subconscious thing? I think you're thinking about this in a different way and, and that's a great question for a thought paper, by the way. But I think you're thinking about this in a different way that I'm gonna explain it. But there are some ways, for instance, um, in the cases of like trauma um, or just something really intense that the person experiences and then later forgets, almost an amnesia, uh, but often we see that it's really more of a psychological than a, than a neurological amnesia, that is to say everything was fine, the person didn't get hurt, but you know they don't remember that really bad accident that happened in front of them. They kind of blocked it out. And so there's a way in which it's not quite conscious yet. I mean, it's conscious in the sense that you're observing it, but there may have never been a, a, a time when it was in memory, right? It sort of went immediately uh, into the unconsciousness. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean, and I can't think of a case where there's something that, there can be stuff that you don't you know, remember. Maybe you decided to start sitting like that when you were five because that was the desk and you made a conscious decision that this was more comfortable, right? And then now you just do it out of habit. But that's probably still subconscious, right? You could probably, if that were the case, go, well, there was this desk when I was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So, good question. Other stuff? Yes, sir. Do like physical, like bodily functions fit anywhere on this, or does this just all have to do with the mind? What are you thinking about? Like, I'm thinking specifically of like breathing, because like unconsciously I breathe, but I can stop myself from breathing. So, would it be like, a subconscious, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, um, sure, behaviors definitely uh, will fit in here. If you're asking where breathing would go, uh, it's, it's probably a great example of something that is subconscious, right? Something that's kind of on this boundary of things uh, that you can be aware of or you can not be aware of. I think that's a great example. Uh, and if you're a Buddhist, right, they're really interested in the breath, and maybe it's because it has some uh, connection to this deeper part of you. I like that thought paper. Other stuff. Okay. <clears throat> now they're drawn out again. There is. So. 
Let me mention this. But Freud, in addition to splitting the mind or the psyche, as he called it, into consciousness and unconsciousness, he also split it up into three additional parts that uh, sort of overlap and sort of don't, but we'll talk about this, into the ego, super ego, and the id. So id uh, literally just translates from Latin to it. Ego is I or me. And super ego is above me. So it me and above me. It ego, super ego. So Freud said that there were these three aspects uh, to our mind. And that these aspects had different roles and that they could often be in conflict with one another. And we will spend some time talking about that conflict, but first just to understand what they are. The id, Freud said, was the part of our mind that really is connected to our most primal instincts and urges. Basic survival stuff, basic thriving as a species. What do you think that means? Eat, sleep, reproduce. Eat, sleep, reproduce. We'll just say sex, huh? What else? There's a couple other things in here. This will get you started and make you grow, but you're not the only person out there. So what else probably needs to be pretty basic to human instinct? Social wiring. No. Fighting. What's that? Fighting. Just fighting? Broadening. I don't necessarily have to fight you. I might, that might be my choice. Like survival of the fittest, like me first before anybody else or something like that. Very good, I'm really just looking for aggression, right? Which includes fighting, which includes survival, but right, I might just yell at you or call you a mean name, uh, or I might punch you in the jaw, right? And so this uh, aggression is, is just a little bit of a broader term. Uh, I think for, for what we mean here. So these very basic survival instincts, these very basic instincts that reside in all of us, and Freud would say sort of connect us back to a more primitive, more beast-like, more animal-like nature, right? That we maybe even share this in common with animals, but that we have this kind of underbelly of ourselves it really is just about eating and fucking killing people who get in our way so let's uh well let's do this example first so let's say now let me tell you these first so super ego uh, the superego above me, uh, what this really represents, what above me is, is really just kind of pointing to here is the idea of God. But what this means is that we have within us this sort of from heaven, we like to think, perhaps kind of moral collection of 
rights and wrongs and things that we should be doing and things that we shouldn't be doing. Anybody have another name for this? Society morals? Morals. Mm, sure, your morals get packed into this Jiminy Cricket like character. No? He watches Pinocchio anymore? It's just a, a collection of morality. Your conscience. Now, it is unfortunate. <laughs> These are very similar sounding words, but here we mean conscience as in let your conscience be your guide, if that quote makes any sense to you. But your conscience, right? Your sense of what's right and wrong. Your sense of morals, right? Your collection uh, of morals would make up your conscience. And so you have this part of your mind, again, from the id that has these very primitive instincts, right? Take what I want, fight what I want, protect myself. You know, I'm bigger than you, I'm gonna have that. But then you also have this part of your mind that's like, well, your mom's taught you, the Bible says, people are gonna think, if you really want to impress such and such, you probably shouldn't. So we have this collection of morals, rights and wrongs, values, and we can easily sum it up as this idea of a conscience. So how are these two guys gonna get along? If both of these pieces are in your head, what's that gonna be like? What's that? There's gonna be some conflict, very good. I saw you shaking your head back there, yes ma'am? Um, I think that there will be, I don't know. You don't know? Don't know. You know. <laughs> what else? Those are two things. Is that what the ego's for? Maybe. There's one more on the board. What are you going to say? One of the biggest conflicts that come from id and super ego is because there's two conflicting ideas. The idea of me and the idea of others. So ego's just kind of like a combination of I need to serve myself without hurting others, I guess. So you're saying this would be a pretty big source of conflict because one is self-directed and one is yeah. and seemingly other-directed. Because to give to others would have to be to take from yourself, and if you're only focused on yourself, you're well, that's you, I mean, that's your values, by the way, that giving to others is something that would be in your conscience, right? That's yours. Describe your values to me. I take from others. No, nope, live on a pirate. <laughs> That's my value system. Does that make sense? Yeah. One thing I want to impress here, and uh, you're just giving me a good segue, one thing I want to impress here is just this idea that even though your superego is derived from your environment, from your surroundings, from the people that talk to you, right, very importantly, your parents, of course, if you have that type of relationship with them, even though that's the case, your superego is very personal. You might hear your parents say it's not right to steal, and then, I don't know, watch them shoplift a mobile phone out of Walmart when they think nobody's looking. Right? And so you might gather something different from that experience than say, your twin brother, who they also told not to steal, but he wasn't there that day. So the idea of this super ego, the idea of having a conscience, conscience is really, really personal. And it will feel like others are telling us, but where is that sense? Where is that voice coming from? Well, that's just coming from inside of you, right? This idea that your own sense of morality really is self-derived. Yes, ma'am? Does your super ego come from your environment? Yes. Okay. Yes. And this is something that you'll see develop over time. We're not talking about development here, but kids are just born with this, right? This is what babies are like. I mean, they're not getting into sex. I mean, you will see them touching themselves and others inappropriately. They don't know what they're doing. But they're just kind of about eating, pooping. You hurt my feelings, I'm going to cry, I'm going to try to hit you. Right? And then they learn some things about the world. Hey, that's not nice. Don't hit mommy. If you want that, ask for it. 
you have to share, right? All of these different things. And so the super ego comes in and it's coming in from the outside, but it is again, personal. Maybe they didn't get that lesson. Maybe share didn't work for them. So let's set up a little scenario. <clears throat> Um, let's say it's earlier than this, or it's, let's say it's whatever time it is, and you haven't eaten yet, you're starving, you didn't have breakfast, <clears throat> and you're starving, it's getting close to lunchtime, and in the door uh, walks a, I don't know, seven-year-old kid, and he comes and sits right next to you, he breaks COVID rules, <laughs> and uh, he's eating whatever is the most desirable food to you at this moment. He's got a plate full of that. So he's sitting right next to you and he's got a plate full of this food. You're starving. What's your id tell you to do? Snatch it. Snatch it? Yeah. Why? Because I'm hungry and he has food and he's smaller than me so I could easily grab it from him and he couldn't do anything. Very good. I'm really glad you got the smaller piece. Sometimes it takes a a little while to fish that out. You're hungry, he's got food, and he's smaller than me, so I can take it, right? Here's the way that it thinks. I'm bigger, I'm stronger, this kid's got food, I won't, I need the food, so get the fuck out of here, kid, that's mine. What's your super ego gonna say about that? Take it. Your super ego's gonna say take it? Why? Do I have money? What'd you say? Do I have money? You can I go buy my own food? I don't know. Do you have money? This is you. If I don't have money, yeah, I'll take it from him. I'm hungry. If okay. Not, if not, then yeah, I'll go buy my own food. And your super ego has no problem? No, not really. Okay. That's your moral set, right? Thank you for sharing. What else? Who's the super ego might have a problem with that? Yes, ma'am. I have a problem with that because I am significantly older than that kid. And, you know, as a little kid, you can just steal it. So somewhere in your super ego, there is a do not steal from children line of code. <laughs> is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? What other reasons might you not take this food? Well, he, might, he might be hungry himself, so he's probably eating because he's starving too or something. So why would I put him in the same situation I'm in? Okay, super ego line of code. Kids are also hungry, care for children. Yes, ma'am. Kids are also kind of gross, so we probably like slobber in it. Okay, it's maybe disgusting, and we're in a pandemic, and I don't need kid germs. Good. What else? A little more selfish, please. What else might you not do that? Oh, I might seem. Sorry. Uh, I probably ask a little more. I'd be like, hey, can I have No, no. So I'll ask you. What are your moral considerations? I would take it, but then I'd be like, I'd register, what are you thinking after I take it? So you do what you wanted, but have some concern for his feelings. Yeah. Okay, hold on to that. What are you going to say? I would be concerned, like, if a whole, like, especially if everyone's in here and they saw me snatch a seven-year-old's food, like, they're going to all think badly of me. Very good. And that's important. I want to stress that because it's not just like these super high level morals or if there really are the good thing no it's kind of like what are the consequences here what's society going to think in addition to what should i do and what would it mean if i did such and such right so the consideration of what is everybody else going to think about me is also a super ego thought right this is not a thing that you do in society society is around me in this moment it's going to look bad if I take food from a child. What's the professor gonna think? Will he fail me for that? I don't know. All of those things, super ego consideration. So, what would you do? What would you actually do? I mean, I can afford my own food. I don't need to take from him. And if, I'm, if it's like a day of without food, I'm not gonna force, it's not gonna bother me. But I mean, if I'm actually hungry, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks, I'm hungry. Okay, so you're holding these two considerations in your head. If you're super hungry, then yeah, it, it, just it. it just depends how hungry am I. Like, you know, and, and when it gets down to it, like, 
how likely am I to survive if I don't take the kids' food? You know what I mean? Okay. And so I hear you saying, that, you know, if you're super hungry, you probably would still take it. If you're not that hungry, you know, you can wait it out and wait till you get out of class. What would you do? Um, well, like, if I'm starving, I honestly might snatch it, but I think that <laughs> that's, like, a different scenario. But I probably would just wait until after class and then go get food. Okay, still um, might snatch it, yeah. but probably wait. What would you do? Well, I honestly eat like one meal a day, so I don't think I'd do anything. So it's probably bad, but I don't good, eat. <laughs> good for you, kid. I'm glad you get to eat. So you wouldn't do anything? No. No. All right, what would you do? Probably just ask the kid if I could have some. Ask the kid for food? What would you do? I'd ask if he's there. Ask? What would you do? Probably nothing. Nothing? Or what do you mean nothing? I would just let him eat it. You would just let him eat it and get something later, suffer through it? Yeah. You're fasting? Yeah. Okay, all of those. <laughs> what would you do? Wait till after class. What would you do? Wait till after class. What would you do? I'd wait till after class. Wait till after class. Ask for some. Ask for some. I'd probably ask. Ask for some. I would wait till after class. Wait till after class. <laughs> wait it out. Wait it out. Y'all are getting nice in the back. These guys are like, I'm, I don't care. <laughs> I just wait it out. Wait. 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 More. So here's what I'm getting at. Because if you've got this conflict, right, what are we talking about today? What's the topic here? Personality. So if you've got this conflict, Freud would say one of the ways that your personality shows up is what you would actually do. Some folks think of the ego as this negotiator, right, that it's kind of going to stand up and say, let's hear from you, let's hear from you. Okay, I've considered the facts. This is what should happen. That's, that's okay. That's an okay definition. But you're giving yourself too much credit in that way. Your ego is <laughs> giving itself too much credit uh, in that way. Which, what it really means is it's what you've decided between that conflict, right? I want the food, and people are going to think I'm an asshole if I just snatch it from the kid. So I snatch it anyway. <laughs> so I wait until after class. So I ask him to share. So I steal a piece when he's not looking. So I bribe him with, I don't know, whatever I've got in my bag. Right, all of those different possibilities are what Freud would say is one of the ways, at least, in, in, in which your personality is gonna show up. It's gonna show up based on this kind of internalized conflict that you have to negotiate, but you're not negotiating it, right? You're, you're sort of being, you're being in between those two, those two places. Does this make sense? Okay, I usually have like a, can you guys talk to each other? <laughs> Is that a rule? I don't know. Uh, I know you can't sit next to each other, so I'm gonna figure out a way for this to work. All right, you three are a group, that's small enough to, you four are a group, okay? Um, you two are a group. I should have signed things as I'm saying it. Okay, id, ego, you three, super ego. Uh, did I say four y'all? Or two, it doesn't matter. Four y'all, id, okay. Uh, let me scoot over there. Ego, and her, that's gonna be awkward, but figure it out. Uh, super ego. And you two figured out the id. Okay. Everybody get a sign something? Okay, here's the thing. You are, um, I don't know where people go to the mall when that used to be a thing. When it used to be a thing. Uh, so you're at the mall. And uh, I don't know, you're there with uh, just a really good friend, a buddy, a buddy of yours, or a girlfriend, friend, what kind of. And you see your recently ex boyfriend girlfriend and they are in like you broke up like two days ago like it's it's been rough and there they are all over somebody else just walking through the mall holding hands kissing up on them and you come upon this based on the part of the psyche i gave you what is your reaction 
what would this part of the psyche do in that situation? Okay? Give me a couple minutes. Yes, sir. How would you describe the basis behind ego? Like, it was, you know, your natural instinct. Superego was the consciousness developed by society and your experiences. What's the basis behind ego? It's you. So, a combination of all of these? Well, I mean, it's considering the situation. Yours is kind of easier, because it's like, what would you actually do? They could have more fun, but it's like, what's reasonable? I wouldn't just walk. I don't think I would. You hear that? See personality, right? Z no, personality. I mean, okay. What did you come up with? Who's got uh, who's got super ego? What did you come up with? Super ego. What are you gonna do to this guy? Okay, so you you just ignore. Okay, so super, super nice thing, not gonna engage. This is the best policy, I'm above it. Yeah. Very good. Super ego. Is that the only one? That's fine, it's the most boring, I'm sorry. <laughs> Where's the ego? Can uh, I go right here? We basically said like, overall we would just walk away, but we'd probably get a little aggressive about it. Like, be like stupid enough, like we would probably go off a little bit, but not directly to the person. Or he said he would just be like, oh fuck. And then just <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you might make a little bit of a scene, but not directly yeah, at the really Like that person depends. might be getting a text, yeah. but you're not gonna say it directly. Okay. I, yeah, I saw you when so. they said I might say something, but we agreed that that would be the overall. But you might say something. Yeah, I might say something. Okay, you're super ego allowed for. It just depends on how pissed I get. Okay, so if it's pissed enough, you're gonna lay into them right then and there. Yeah, but I wouldn't like attack the person they were with, and I wouldn't like actually like, like I wouldn't like destroy them or anything, but I would just say something. Why are you saying that? <laughs> Where'd that come from? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. All right, so good, right? You're fighting this middle ground, and I actually respect that you're saying you, you have some awareness of these other impulses. Well, I wouldn't do that. I would just... Yeah, because I'd probably want to hurt them. <laughs> see, he's, he's woke. He does what he wants. All right, uh, or super ego. What you got? You said that we kind of acknowledge that's happening, but we wouldn't say anything. We wouldn't be over time to do anything about it. Okay, so you would just know it, but you wouldn't say anything at all. Kind of just walk away. Day. You guys all agree with that? <laughs> I like to make a scene. Okay, strong, there's some strong super egos over here. You know, egos allowed to be a little bit petty. I think it's more of the fact that it's like, at that point, it makes the breakup easier to make it through that. I mean, why push something out there, you know? Like, it's not, I don't think it's like a, a progression. It's be more like, it's not worth my time. Like, that's how they feel as a walk away. All right, you're a senior, right? Yeah. See, this is what maturity looks like. <laughs> and that's this question of seniors, the freshman. Right? I appreciate it. That hurts. What, what, what are you saying? Um, in my like, don't ask, don't ask if you don't need to kind of thing. Like that's, I guess, like my super ego stuff. Okay, so you're not gonna cause any problems if it's not necessary. Yeah. Okay, some big people in there, I appreciate it. All right, where's the ids at? Let's, let's get down to it. Um, we said we uh, most likely respond with aggression and towards both parties, most likely. Okay, what would you do? Exactly. I'd probably beat him up. Okay, so you beat him up? Yeah. All right, good. Pretty in life, right here? Yeah, just like make a scene, like blow up on each other. Okay, so make a scene, blow up. Just yelling? Or fight him. Fight him. No. Wait a Who said no? Did you say no? It doesn't know the meaning of the. Oh, probably. So, like, they can kill. I mean, I don't know. Depends on how you do it. Any other is? Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you ever seen those mean girls? Yes. You know where they're at, like, the mall or the water hole? Yeah. They're probably kind of like that. Okay. It's, but 
But yeah, very aggressive. Okay. Party. Um, so you're just gonna lay lay into it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good life. And so what I want you to understand here, right, is that there is an extreme here. That's that's possible. I'm gonna kill them. <laughs> yeah. And and you kind of mean it. But you can dial that back. Now the idea that you might want to kill them is a little Unpalatable, right? It's not a killing anybody. It's just an X. But this is why it's in your unconscious. For Freud, the whole reason that we have an unconscious in the first place, and this is pretty specific to Freud, but Freud believed that the whole reason we have an unconscious is because there's shit about ourselves that we don't want to know, that we don't want to see, that we don't want to deal with. For Freud, most of them were aggressive or sexual. I mean, talking about one against losing your mom. We're still going to get to that. But it might also include wanting to kill people, to brutalize them in some way. right? And we don't like to think of ourselves that way. If the ego has a purpose, it's to protect you from yourself. It's to allow you to have a conception of yourself, right? to live in this sort of human gift of sentience while not paying attention to all of the terrible things that we could be capable of knowing about ourselves if we were really paying attention. Right. This includes our instincts, but also existential things, right? That we're going to die. You know, body functions. That we just maybe block out and just handle it and don't necessarily want to think about it. Right? All of that type of stuff that it really means to be human, that we want to think of ourselves in a good way, we want to think of ourselves in a good light. It's the ego's job to defend that sense of ourselves. It's the ego's job to make sure that we don't dislike ourselves too much, that we don't gross ourselves out too much, that we don't you know, think of ourselves as disgusting or perverted or evil or dangerous. The ego wants us to think we're good people. Question? Yeah, for it, so it's just your most bare bones nature, right? So then in the response to this question, what would the most id response be to kill the guy and take the girl? Yep. Or, you know, vice versa? Absolutely. For, like, do you want to get rid of the competitors and have a reproductive mate or as many as possible? Cause like, yeah. Because, like, the stuff in my head is lions. So lions have the pride, so, but there's one male for pride. And if another male comes in, they're either fighting to death or fighting until one leaves. And then they'll kill the king of the previous male to then reproduce the female. Exactly. So wouldn't that be like the most? Yes. That's your bare bones animal instinct, right? Is kill him, take what you want. And I'm not keeping these kids, so. <laughs> Sarah Laker. Yes. So when like the ego and the super ego fail to like hide the id, is that when like mental conditions start to like come up? Like, what a great question! It's like I planted you here for my segues. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what happens when the id, the ego, and the super ego can't come to some conclusion that the ego can consciously and, um, I don't know, feel good about in, in acting or feeling or doing. Freud called this conflict between any parts of the mind. Now we sort of noted how the superego and the id can be in conflict, but really the ego can be in conflict too. Again, the ego's job is to defend you from yourself or to make you think good of yourself. What are some ways in which the ego, for instance, in the id might land in conflict? What are some ways in which they might be conflicted with each other? The id and the ego. Anybody ever done something and then said, I did that. Have I ever done that? Yes. Yeah. So 
here's a moment where your id and your ego are in some conflict, right? You had a reality that may have been born out of some instinct, and then it happened, and you think, who was that guy? How did I let that happen, right? This type of thing. And so there's no, there's some super ego in the sense of that was a bad thing, but the fact that it happened and you did it puts those two in conflict as well. So they can be in conflict in, in a lot of different ways. It's not just id and super ego. I just want to lay that out. Freud called this conflict between these parts of the mind. Call this an intra psychic conflict. Um, intra just means within, psychic, of course, means the mind, so it's just saying it's a conflict within the mind. Intra psychic conflict. And so again, he's thinking about how these three aspects might be in conflict with each other. You have an instinct that you feel like is immoral or you've done something that you don't feel like reflects the type of person that you are or you have some moral that you don't think reflects the type of person that you are, right? Freud said that this could resolve or manifest in three different ways. The first, he said, is consciously. That is to say, if we can hold, I erase it, but I have the iceberg up there, if we can hold in our consciousness this conflict, this sense of wanting to do, for instance, and not wanting to do, that, that would feel a certain way. Let me give you a concrete example. I'm going to up the stakes a little bit, see if I can make you feel it. Let's uh, say you graduate from college, <clears throat> you get a really good job, uh, a few years later you get married, wonderful person, um, and then a few more layers, for a few more layers, a few more years later on the job, <clears throat> after you know, you've been with your wife or husband or partner for a number of years, and it's fine, it really is. You get this new secretary, starts to work for you. And uh, I don't know, it's just something about he or she is exactly your type and about 10 years younger than your wife or husband. And I don't know, but I think you're kind of flirting with me. What's your id want? <laughs> Sex. Anybody gonna have a problem with that? Yeah, I'd say both of them would have some issue with it. Okay. Well, your ego won't have a problem unless your super ego, in this case, does first, right? There's got to be something wrong with wanting the sex before either of them chime in. But you're saying the super ego might say. Wrong with oh, sex. I you, you uh, it's probably she's gonna pretty. Say, I'm her boss. Like, like it's probably going to say like that's how you have a perfectly fine family at home, and you have no like you're I don't know you're being satisfied probably at home, so you're fine. Like you probably shouldn't do that. Okay, you're giving me you are talking to me through your ego, right? Talk to me through the super ego. You've seen what it does, what it does before, why would you cause it yourself? Okay, you've seen it cause problems before I didn't hear you saying. Why would you uh, do why would that? You cause it yourself? Why would you cause that? What else? Yes, ma'am? Uh, what are my peers going to think about it? What are my, I work, I work with these folks, right? They're going to see us if we get too cozy with each other. What else? <laughs> what is my wife going to Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know, <laughs> my partner. He's like, 
I don't know, what are the coworkers gonna think? Yeah, you know, you're married. It might cause an issue with your marriage. What's your wife gonna think? It's gonna hurt, uh, we'll just make it a, a guy for now, right? It's gonna hurt who, who, you know, it's gonna hurt our relationship. It's gonna hurt her. What will it do if the, if the kids find out, right? Good. All right, we tapped in the super ego. It took a minute, y'all. We're like, sounds great. So your super ego is going to have these these problems, okay? And your id's going to want something else. And here your ego, I don't know, maybe it can deal with it the first day. I'm just not going to look at her. I'm just not going to talk to her. I'm not going to talk to her much. I mean, I'm just going to ask her to do her job, and then I'm going to tell her to get out. Right? But you're working with her for weeks, and then months, and then years. And every day, your id wants sex. And every day, you're trying to call on your super ego to make that not happen. So if you can hold on to that, that conflict consciously, right? And we felt this way, I mean, whether it's been a sexual feeling or not, right? Folks have felt this way. I, I both want something and I don't want it and I don't want to want it, right? You felt that way. If you can hold that in your head, what does it feel like? What does that feel like if you can hold both of those things? Feels like war. Say? Feels like war. War? Yeah, Give me like an emotional war. word. Stress. What's that? Stress. Feels like stress. Very good. What else? What else? feel like um, if on this particular day, I don't know, you let her come into your office, you got a nice couch, and you're sitting there, and she sat down and had a couple drinks, and your knees touched. You, you, you left when you when you had to, but you got home, and your wife seemed especially interested. She just said, how was your day today? She just talking a lot. What's that? Anxiety. What describe that anxiety for you? Why did you say that? I mean, it's just gonna throw us into stress, but like you're I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> okay, you're anxious. Good. Okay, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you might feel guilty. Okay, you might feel guilty. Good. You might feel ashamed. might feel embarrassed, right? All of these, yeah. Could it not be like a positive emotion if like you feel, I don't know, like I feel like, what if you take it as like empowering into your relationship since you don't do it? You know what I mean? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> we're, we're gonna get there, okay. but that's helpful, right? But, but then it's not a conflict, right? Then it doesn't reach this level of, your super ego doesn't necessarily chime in. If it's truly a conflict, you're gonna, and you're thinking about it, right? You might feel it. But basically, right, this is what we're talking about. Freud said that if you can handle that conflict consciously, if you can hold on to it consciously, well, then that's gonna feel like some form of anxiety, right? Whether that be stress or shame or guilt or embarrassment, that you're gonna feel some sense of anxiety by having this conflict that you can't resolve being tossed around in your head. The second way was physical. Freud said that if you couldn't allow yourself to think about the conflict, but you still had some low level awareness of it. You still had some sense of it, even if you weren't sort of stating it to yourself. I'd like to sleep with my secretary, but I'm married. Even if you weren't stating it, that you were, <laughs> that you might experience that conflict physically. What's that gonna be like? Like being aroused. Okay, could be aroused. What else? First time I've had that one. Like a tense heart almost? 
intense tarp? Yeah. Like the hardy kind? No, no, <laughs> like, um, how can you describe it? Like, uh, it's, it's like, like, your like how your heart would feel if you're anxious. Heart race. No. No? No. What is your heart? No, it's like, like a crushing feeling. Like a, like it's a black ball in your heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when you're really anxious about something? It's like your pressure? Yeah, I can yeah. feel it right now when he's talking about it. So. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> I don't get. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you guys are different hearts than me. Okay, hard. <laughs> it's like the almost like the feeling of butterflies, but like harder than that. Yeah. Interesting. It's like it's like an iron ball. Okay. It's like butterflies. Heart pressure. <laughs> okay. Good. No, no, that's great. That's actually helpful. I'll say something about. It. What else? He said it's like another way that you might. Experience conflict physically. Upset stomach. Good. An upset stomach. Your hair stand up. Okay. Yes, ma'am? Like okay, good. Jumpy. So many big butterflies, right? All of these things that today we would recognize as what? Muscle aches, also. Back aches. We recognize these things as what today? Signs of what? Signs of anxiety, looking for signs of stress, right? Today we would say, oh, you're getting headaches, you're, you're feeling some tightness in your chest, you're getting upset stomach, butterflies in your stomach, your hairs are standing up, you're really jumpy, right? These would be signs of stress today, right? We would just say this person's got stress. Stress is a type of anxiety. But we recognize that there are some ways, and it's maybe not news today, but it was news when Freud wrote it, right? We recognize today that there are some physical ways in which a psychological conflict will show up in your body, right? Your back gets tight, you get a headache, all of these different things are ways in which it's being suppressed a bit, right? You're not thinking, oh shit, oh shit, I feel so bad for having that drink with my secretary earlier, right? It's not consciously in your head that you're worried about what if my wife finds out, but it's kind of just, why are you so tense? I don't know, I don't know, right? This other way of dealing with conflict, dealing with anxiety. <clears throat> the last way. Go fast into the camera, but the last way uh, that Freud said that you could deal with <clears throat> intrapsychic conflict was, of course, unconscious. And so Freud says, if you can't deal with it consciously, if you're not even ready to have anxiety about it, if you can't even keep it in your body, if you've got to press it down so deep that you can't even bring it fully into your awareness, then you're going to employ what we call defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are. Oh, I can recite it for a young book. So, the physical ways that intrapsychic conflict manifests is that kind of like a subconscious almost? I guess you could think of it that way. It's, it's the type of thing that. You know, you're sitting at your desk and your secretary walks by and, oh, she's cute. No, don't think that. Oh, God. You know, it, it's that type of thing, right? So it's, uh, it is available to you, but you're like, whoa, get out of here, right? Versus here where you might be mulling it over. Oh, God, I can't believe I'm thinking this, right? So in this other way, you, you sort of can acknowledge it, but you 
keep it at bay. I guess you could think of that as subconscious, where subconscious really means you had to go get it. Here you're sort of trying to push it down. Um, but here in the defense mechanisms, right, we're going to get a little bit closer to truly unconscious. I just want to give you this definition, um, and then maybe one or two, and then you'll get the other ones via video. But um, defense mechanisms. They are unconscious actions, unconscious actions, techniques, and strategies. Unconscious actions, techniques, and strategies that reduce conscious psychological distress. Unconscious actions, techniques, and strategies that reduce Conscious psychological distress. Reduce conscious psychological distress resulting from unaccepted impulses. Resulting from unaccepted impulses and or troubling realities. Troubling realities. Defense mechanisms are unconscious actions, techniques, and strategies that reduce conscious psychological distress, resulting from unaccepted impulses and or troubling realities. Anybody put that into plain speak? What's that mean? Conscious actions, techniques, strategies. Just like reacting to push people or things away. Okay, to push people or things away. I, I would probably say more things, right? These kind of psychological things. In particular, these unaccepted impulses. What's an example of an unaccepted impulse? Buying for your secretary one little life. Very good. I want to sleep with my secretary, but I have a wife. I do not want to accept that impulse, right? Or what's a troubling reality? That you, that you want to. What's that? That you want to. You said that you want to, right? Yeah. That you do want this thing. He says the economy. Okay. Um, so, right, so defense mechanisms are going to be these things that when you find something about yourself that you don't like, you've got this unaccepted impulse, or there's some troubling reality about your situation or you that you might defend yourself from those thoughts, from those feelings. The first of these give you at least one. Maybe not. The first of these is I'll tell you, it's denial. Denial of the defense mechanism. It's a turning away from what's actually there. Sweetie, I heard you got a new secretary at work. Is she cute? I don't know. I barely even look at her. She's in the other room. Right? Denial. Just, it's clearly there. If you gave the guy a couple beers and he's out with his buddies, and you ask him about his secretary, he knows, right? He knows what he thinks about her. And yet at this moment, he just doesn't want to face that, right? Or at least he doesn't want to admit it, okay? So in the next couple classes, we will go through uh, more of these. There's about 12. And so you'll see me pick it up uh, on Tuesday with the other class going through these lists of defense mechanisms. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll probably start talking about uh, Freud's psychosexual stages. That's always a crowd pleaser. So I'll see you guys uh, next week. Have a good weekend.